from the start of the 2018 Attack Tour. Welcome to the GCN Show. What's the GCN Show? Watch it. Welcome to the GCN Show, brought to you by Wiggle. This week we are celebrating Peter Sagan, one of the greatest riders of all time, a true goat. This week in the world of cycling, we learnt that the Football World Cup is affecting cycling in more ways than one. Not only are the Tour de France stages starting particularly early, but Mark Cavendish is sporting some soccer-inspired cycling shoes from his sponsors Nike. Check out these bad boys. Do you like them? Um, they're interesting, definitely. Yeah, yeah. bling. Mm, yeah. We also learned that Lawson Craddock is one tough he crashed in the feed zone in stage one of the tour, but he's continued riding despite having a fractured scapula and multiple stitches above the eye. Not an ideal start to the tour for me. Uh, I think we'll see how I feel tonight. Um, maybe get on the bike in the morning just to, just to give it a feel. But, I mean, I put too much work in. Uh, That really is heartbreaking stuff on the first day of the Tour de France, isn't it? However, Lawson decided to turn a huge negative into a huge positive. He has decided to contribute $100 for every stage that he finishes to the Alkek Velodrome, which is where he started competing as a cyclist and which was damaged in Hurricane Harvey. So if you'd like to get involved in those contributions, there's a GoFundMe link in the description below. And finally this week, we learned that Peter Sagan is a goat. <laughs> or should that be... The goat, or at least one of the goats. We should probably explain for people my age and older that goat, apparently, according to Google, means greatest of all time. Correct, yeah, I looked it up and Google I agreed saw you with us. Yeah. yeah, so anyway, this year in January, we questioned whether Peter Zagan was all style and no substance. And now we have an answer for you, which is that he is both style and substance. He is, most definitely. I think we should start here with a video sent in to us by Killian Kelly, who's giving us a stat per day from the Tour de France for our tour highlights. Peter Sagan is the first rider to win a stage of the Tour de France in three different years as world champion. Now, there's a small club of riders who have been even able to try and do that over the years. Alfredo Binda, Rick van Steenbergen, Eddie Merckx and Oscar Freire all won the world championships three times, as did Peter Sagan, but none of them were able to win a tour stage in each of the following years. Even Eddie Merckx didn't do it. He won his first world title in 1967 and didn't ride the Tour de France until 1969. So Peter Sagan is the first. Well, when you start to surpass the records of the likes of Eddie Merckx, you know that you will forever be known as one of cycling's greats. And actually, the way he started this year's tour really cements his place in history, doesn't mm. it? I think it does, yeah. So as we record this, they have completed two road stages. He was second in the first one, and he won stage two, which means he's also got the green jersey already and the yellow jersey to boot, which prompted me to take a look at pro cycling stats and his overall record over the years of mass start road stage finishes in the this race and those stats are just like ridiculous. They are fat. Yeah, it's just sick. So he's done 99 mass start road stages and out of those he's finished in the top 10 on 56 occasions and he's finished in the top three on 36 occasions plus he's won the green jersey at every Tour de France in which he hasn't been disqualified. That's insane. I mean that consistency is matched by well, like literally nobody in the modern era. But the stat I really love is how many days, or perhaps that should be how few, he's actually worn his trade team kit because he's had so many days in the rainbow jersey or the yellow jersey or the green jersey or the national champions jersey that the last time he actually wore just his normal trade team kit and anything except the national championships was back in June 2011 at the Tour de Suisse. Wow. Well, talking of the Tour de Suisse, he's actually got the record there for stage wins, having won 16 over the years, and he's won a stage of the Tour de Suisse every year since 2011. Wow, that is, those are good stats, but do you know this? In his last 100 one-day races, he's finished in the top 10 59 times. Not bad, but what about this? He has been eligible for 41 points jerseys at stage races throughout his career, and he's won 26 of them, and I'm not even finished yet, so don't start butting in. <laughs> also, this year, he's had 36 days of racing, and he's been in the top 10 25 times. Beat that. All right, but I've got a graph, actually. Mm. Oh, I've got a PhD, I've got a graph. Yeah, yeah, look, 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 hang on. 
Look, look. I was only joking. No, it's my pointer. Well, hang on. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, I've got three graphs because I thought it might be interesting to compare Sagan with some other similar kinds of riders. So, went for Cavendish, Boonen, and Cancellara, and of course, Merckx, and uh, totted up how many wins, podiums, and top tens they had in the best five years of their career. And I went to Lloydy here to ask him which were their best five years, five consecutive years, I should add, and then I just compared them. So as you can see here, just in terms of pure wins, <clears throat> Got a pointer here, right here. Uh, there were actually years when uh, Cavendish and Boonen were way up there with Sagan, but but when you go to podiums, you can see that Sagan is actually more consistent, arguably. Mm. And then top tens, it's even more clear. Look at this. This is me at the bottom, is it? By the way. Yeah, that is. I thought we'd put you in as, as look, reference. Look, you very had... close to Spartacus. <laughs> that is 2008. You had a total blinder. That was top tens. You had loads. I think you had yeah. like 18 or Double 20. Double figures. Yeah, it was Blue brilliant. Good, it was a good year in the Lloyd household. <laughs> it is worth noting that Merckx is well clear on every stat, whether it's top tens, podiums, or or wins. But then again, it was a different era of racing, wasn't it? Yeah. As much as I'm reluctant to admit it, those graphs are actually quite good. Thanks. Uh, do but like it does graph. really show how much better Merckx is than everybody that's come after him, doesn't it? I mean, Merckx did race more days per year, yeah. but that's staggering how far above he is. Yeah. Right. You finished with your graphs? Yeah, yeah, that's enough. Let's get back to normal. So, in conclusion, Sagan is really bloody good. Mm, the proof is in the graph, isn't it? Uh, anyway, I think what also makes him a GOAT is not just his remarkable results over the years, but also a couple of other factors. Firstly, he looks like a complete athlete, doesn't he? You wouldn't be surprised that if he wasn't a pro cyclist, he could be almost equally good at a multitude of other sports. I mean, how many pro cyclists can do this? And then secondly, I mean, how many pro cyclists are featured in mini films as John Travolta in Greece or as Forrest Gump? Yeah, probably not very many. Life was like a box of chocolate. You never know what you are gonna get. Yeah, and then we come to his personality, which is sometimes quite frustrating to journalists trying to get a soundbite, but which is just genuinely endearing to cycling fans. I mean, why so serious being his, uh, his current slogan. Yeah. I mean, he clearly just loves racing his bike. Yeah, why so serious? He says that quite <laughs> a lot of times at the moment, doesn't he? Uh, there's also, beyond his personality, his bike handling skills, which really are second to none. Loves his stunts and wheelies, but beyond that, he rarely crashes, does yeah. he? I was trying to think back uh, when Peter Sagan has hit the deck in races. There was stage one of the 2013 tour. There was an incident at the Tour of Flanders last year where he was running a bit too close to the barriers and his handlebars snagged on a raincoat. There was a stage of the Tour Down Under in 2010. And there was a stage of the World Tour where he got knocked off by a motorbike, which wasn't really his fault. So effectively, three crashes in nine years. That's not too bad. That's amazing. I mean, in fact, he basically, he's lost less skin in his entire pro career than most cyclists lose in just one race. Yeah, or ex-pros. Look at the state yeah, of that. Yeah, all right, all right. Well, you can talk limping around the office with your dodgy hip after your mountain bike crash. Oh, oh, that hurt. That did. Yeah, I know. Okay. It, it looks very painful. I'm, I'm no Peter again, I'll admit that. Probably the proof was in the pudding way before my mountain bike crash, uh, but I'll take that nevertheless. Right then, this is the point at which we would like you to get involved. Can Peter Sagan really be classified as a GOAT, reminder, greatest of all time, even though he's likely never to win the overall at Grand Tour? Or you could actually let us know if there's anything you don't like about Peter Sagan. Ooh. That could be quite interesting, given that he does seem to be a real favourite with the fans. Yeah, I'm not sure I've ever heard of anyone that doesn't like Peter Sagan. Let us know. It's now time for cycling shorts. We're going to begin with some good news. You could ride in the pro peloton. Yeah, I mean, in theory at least, but a study that was carried out at Eindhoven University put 121 mannequins on bikes in a wind tunnel and then tested to find out how much wind resistance each one was experiencing. Yeah, and at the sweet spot in the peloton, it was found that a rider would only face 5% of the resistance that they would otherwise encounter if they were riding on the front or alone. Yeah, although that doesn't actually translate as just 5% of the power because it doesn't take into consideration the other factors like rolling resistance that would contribute to the overall resistance. But nevertheless, it does make me think that were we to actually get on the start line of the Tour de France, we might be able to keep up on the flat for a bit and then maybe set some KOMs. 
Absolutely. But this wasn't the only secret of the Tour de France that was potentially revealed this week. The English newspaper The Telegraph reported on the new wonder sports drink containing ketone esters that apparently seven Tour de France teams are using. Now, ketones, FYI, are produced naturally in the body, in the liver, in fact, when your body doesn't get enough energy from food. And what they do is they encourage your body to actually conserve its precious stores of glycogen by burning fat as fuel instead. Now, they can be reproduced outside of the body, but it's a pretty expensive process, and one that actually is owned, the patent is owned, by Oxford University. So there you go, cheeky little fact for you. But all in all, a bottle of the stuff costs 30 euros, as in like an energy drink. Yeah, that's right. And interestingly, the technology has been around a while, but Team Sky's nutritionist told The Telegraph that he wasn't convinced and that Team Sky are not using it. So seven Tour de France teams apparently using this stuff, Sky not one of them. No, and that is interesting, isn't it? Because there were a few kind of suggestions that maybe ketones have been part of Froome's nutrition strategy on his epic Giro d'Italia stage win, that's stage 19, but clearly not. Clearly they are unfounded rumours. In other news, there's a really cool story come out of Edmonton in Canada. Now this has been reported in the Edmonton Journal, a publication that both me and Si are avid subscribers of. Now this story talks about how a group of cyclists in Edmonton, 600 volunteers, have all banded together to combat bike theft. Now this is all built around a Facebook group called the Stolen Bikes Edmonton Group and they're basically reporting any and looking out for any stolen bikes that have been reported. Yeah, now apparently bike theft is often carried out by quite a small group of criminals who then cause widespread carnage and so actually a group like Edmonton's could genuinely have a really positive effect on the cycling community. That's right, so there you go people, let's mobilise, let's get organised, let's fight these Crims? Yeah, scumbags. <laughs> now, we're a week late on this, but we want to tell you about it anyway, because it's kind of cool. So around the summer solstice, that's the longest of the year, there were a couple of very cool events. You mean Donnie's GMBM ride? Three cool events. I mean, that was really good and definitely well worth a watch. But no, these ones were called Race to the Sun. So the idea being that it's a ride from coast to coast, from east to west, starting at dawn and then riding across to the finish before dusk and as I said there were two one was across Italy and one was across the UK and in total 700 people took part yeah I really like that concept because it kind of adds another dimension to a really epic ride and uh, apparently they're looking to expand it but it just means finding some new venues so yeah you'd have thought you... it'd be quite hard to find the right venue for a coast to coast wouldn't you yeah what, what do you reckon like New Zealand in December maybe yeah I'll tell you what would be kind of cool race across Iceland because then you'd have like two weeks to do it before the sunset <laughs> Yeah, that'd be awesome. Cheating. It's not all about epics though. We told you about the Red Bull Million Mile Commute a few weeks ago, and we thought we'd drop back in to give you an update. Yeah, it is now the 10th of July as this show goes up. And apparently the Red Bull Million Mile Commute is currently on 300,000 miles. So an amazing achievement, but fractionally behind schedule. So do make sure that you get involved. And also remember that if you buy a special kind of Red Bull, which has the Million Mile Commute logo on there, you get a month of free Strava Premium. Nice. Right, back to the studio, where Lloyd is going to try and win a beer. Good luck, Dan. We can just go buy one now, couldn't we? Yeah, well, right, let's do it. Next up, it's the GCN Wiggle of Fortune, your chance to win one of four Wiggle voucher amounts. Starting with prize four, that's £25. Prize three is 50 Prize two, £75 of vouchers. And then the big one, prize one, £150 to spend as you wish on anything that you find at Wiggle's online shop. And of course, the opportunity to win a beer for Dan. And it is thirsty work commentating <coughs> on the Tour de France. So let's hope that Dan has his thirst quenched this week. Yes. And anyway, don't forget that if you would like to be part of this competition, you can follow the link in the description below to put your name forward for the Wiggle of Fortune. And uh, let's get on to this week's uh, lucky contestant, who is Savas Sava. Annibal. That's the one, yeah. Coming in from Cypre. So best of luck to you, Savas. Uh, let's hope it's the big one, 150 pounds this week. Are you ready? In three, in two, in one, and we are off. <coughs> Alright, there's the beer. That's the one I keep my eye on every week, of course. And it's gone past, it's not going to get back there again. So which prize are you going to get? Prize one, it's going to go past that. Prize four, let's hope for prize three. 
just gone on to price three, Sarah. So that is 50 pounds of vouchers. Uh, we'll get them over to you as soon as we possibly can. Let us know what you spend them on over at the Wiggle online shop. Tech of the week now, and despite being at Eurobike and surrounded by 1,400 brands, all showcasing their latest and greatest, we're actually gonna tell you about two that aren't here. And for good reason. Firstly, they both look amazing. And secondly, we've been filming loads of awesome tech for GCN and GCN tech, and we don't wanna double up. But the first bike is the Trek Madone, and the second one, or Bayer were the first brand to take advantage of the UCI dropping its three to one ratio with regards to tube shapes. And this helped them make the bike more aerodynamic. So features such as the wide bow shaped fork, the cam tail profile of the down tube and other features as well, such as the oval seat post clamp and a ton of other little details that help make the Orbea Orca really aero and slippery without feeling like a wet fish. And what about the Trek Madone then? Well, just like the Orbea, this too comes in a rim and disc brake version. Actually, this is the first disc brake version of the Venerable platform. And interestingly, I think, Trek didn't set out to actually improve the aerodynamic performance of this. I mean, by all accounts, it was kind of class leading anyway. But what they wanted was to actually improve the all round usability of the bike. That's right, so the bike features an updated version of Trek's ISO speed decoupler at the rear, which is Trek's kind of proven method of improving the compliance of a bike and is similar to that found on the Trek Domani. However, this new version actually is tunable via a bolt that's on the top tube. And they've also looked to improve compliance in the front of the bike as well. So they've actually changed the cockpit and now it's a two-piece system rather than the one-piece integrated bar and stem that was found on the old version. Yeah, not, adds a nice bit of tunability, you think. Yeah. I think we should also mention that the new paint jobs look absolutely stunning, don't they? Incredible. Yeah, they, they definitely could make quite the statement. Much like Mark Cavendish's new cycling shoes, which, mm. which look quite a lot like football boots, I think. It's coming home. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, hopefully for Cav as well, perhaps. I mean, I'm not biased, but still, it would be nice to see him nudge a little closer to Merckx, wouldn't it? Yeah. Maybe his football boots will help. Racing news now. Uh, don't forget, if you'd like detailed analysis of the biggest races, the Tour de France and the Giro Rosa, they're over on our Facebook page. Or alternatively, I went through a lot of them on our dedicated racing news show here on YouTube yesterday. Here though on the GCN show, we're firstly going to focus on a couple of rumours. Yes, indeed. First off, Gregor Brown has reported that Richie Porte has signed a two-year deal with Trek Segafredo. Now, of course, Porte currently at BMC. The future is a little bit uncertain. One would imagine that he would slot straight into Grand Tour team leadership duties which might put Balka Mollema's nose slightly out of joint. Yes, could well do, couldn't it? Interesting to see whether that rumour is true and also mm. how many domestiques he might take along with him. Uh, the other rumour came from the Dutch newspaper De Telegraaf. Uh, they have speculated that world cyclocross champion Wout van Aert uh, might have penned a new deal with Lotto NL Jumbo, which could start as soon as next year, 2019. Yep, apparently a four-year deal on the cards, and there's no doubt that he would massively boost their Classics team. Mm. Anyway, back to Tour de France news, and Fernando Gaviria won the opening road stage in his first ever Tour de France. Do you know who the last rider was to do that? No. No, well, here's Killian Kelly to tell you. Today's Tour de France Stage 1 GCN stat of the day is that Fernando Gaviria, the Colombian sprinter, is the first rider to win the opening stage of his Tour de France career and take the yellow jersey for the first time since Ward Sells, the Belgian rider, did it in 1964, beating Michael Wright in the sprint. A couple of riders have done it in prologue time trials, uh, including Fabian Cancellara and Chris Boardman, but not since 1964 has anybody done it on their opening road stage of the Tour de France. And that brings us on to hack forward slash bodge. And I'm really excited. This is my first one. Yeah. You ready? Oh, as I was born ready. Okay. <clears throat> first up, we've got this one sent in by TryJohn85. Productive morning with my little human. $20 <laughs> sawhorse, old front bike hub, some pipe saddle brackets, 30 minutes of my time, and we have ourselves a brand new work stand. You know what? I think that's pretty cool. And I also love the slight kind of dichotomy here of like a, you know, probably an $8,000 bike and a homemade work stand. Genius. Priorities. Absolutely, yeah, no, I like that. That's very cool. I think that's a hack, straight off the bat. Yeah, right. hack. Cool, right, next up, what have we got? We have got, well, a headset protector from Junu 180. 
here's a, a little hack for you to protect your headset with an inner tube. You know what? That is a proper vintage hack. Now, I used to do that on my mountain bikes back in the early 90s, uh, but I can't quite see how you've done it. But basically, if you get a small enough inner tube, you cut it, and then you take your forks out, you put the inner tube over the forks, then when you put it back, you then kind of like pop it over the frame as well to create that seal. So yeah, if you live in England, uh, or if there is anywhere else in the world with weather quite as bad as us, then you might want to consider doing that as well. So you're going hack? Yep, hack, done. Right then, Mark Quigley, trying to tilt the elbow pads on my TT bike, I like this, He's taken, this is another retro one. Uh, if anyone's got V-brakes out there, remember the little kind of tiltable washers, he stuck those on his TG bike, painted them black, which is just taking it to the next level. And there you go, voila, adjustable angle on your TT bars. What do you think, Ollie? I think, I think it's, it's a good idea, but until maybe, I'm probably worried about hitting a bump at speed during a TT with a, that sort of thing on there, so. But yeah, that's a relatively important consideration. Yeah. In this space. Are they UCI legal tilted bars? Yeah, well, yeah, I believe they are these oh, days. Well, yeah. there we go then. Right. Kind of a hack if you survive. So good luck. Uh, right, next up, we've got a Trier Blitz. Uh, this is super cool. An <laughs> office chair strapped to your bike instead of a saddle. And I mean, I'm looking at it. It's, com it's might, comfy. I think there might be some duct tape going on, actually. I was hoping it would be welded, but no, I think it's just silver duct tape. I mean, that's hack. It, that's, I think it's a bodge, isn't it? I mean, straight up, that's a bodge. Yeah. That's a bodge. The theory is hack worthy. The, the Execution. Outcome, yeah, it's bodge. <laughs> Definite bodge. Right, okay. Now for this next one, which is quite confusing. Pioneering on-bike Tupperware from Jack F. Cooper. I mean, he's got a bottle and he's put some food in it. Well, what is that inside his bowl? I'm not even sure what's in there. No, I don't know either, but I, mean, I suppose it is a place to store dry food. But um, I also quite like the bottle, Ride DMC. So uh, it'd be better if it said Run DMC, but still, yeah. I like that one. Uh, right, this next one, or oh, did we say that was a hack or a bodge? That's a bodge. <laughs> uh, that's a bodge. <laughs> yeah, I think it is as well, actually. Right, Arthur Osorio, uh, my wife's hybrid had nowhere to attach a water bottle cage. He says, presumably, because women don't drink water. I'm not uh, sure that's strictly true. No, but. Fuji probably do have some answers, questions to answer. That's what I was going for. Anyway, so he attached one to a rack mount point instead. Uh, well, that is a bodge, isn't it? It's a bodge from Fuji because you've made a bike without water bottle bosses. And yeah. it's kind of a bodge from you, but you've, I suppose, got around a problem. Yeah. I would have thought that would get in the way of your leg. Yeah, I would have thought your leg would catch that. Bodge. bodge yeah. Right, moving on. Oh, good grief. <laughs> Oh man, that really gives me the creeps. I think, I, right, okay. I'm, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna be an asterisk on this one. If that toilet brush is brand new and has only ever exclusively been used on bottles, then it's a hack. If, if, it's, if it's a previous, if it's a recycled toilet brush, then that is definitely a bodge. <laughs> I, th I wouldn't even trust a toilet brush factory to produce <laughs> sterile toilet brushes. I mean, perhaps it is producing the exact same standards as a, as a genuine bottle brush, but I just, just one look at that next to your sink, just, I don't know. Is it a hack or a bodge? I, I'm, I'm sticking with my, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a hack with an asterisk on it. Oh, frankly terrifying. Anyway, that was sent in by Alex Pond. Uh, Alex, if you've got horrific food poisoning, uh, <laughs> then please let us know. And if you're okay, then similarly, we'd like to know, just make sure that you're okay. Uh, right then, lastly, I think we're gonna end on a high because this is pretty bonkers. Given that we've actually seen something that Wahoo are producing for real, and someone's done a hack version, which presumably takes some serious engineering skills. Yeah, so David Whelan has said that this is Bluetooth controlled, variable speed fan, 39 miles per hour it can go with max wow. airflow. And uh, it has a fan speed range of 40% to 100%. And the fan speed can vary according to his heart rate, cycling speed, or power, and he's controlling it using an iPhone app, and it works with Zwift and Trainer Road. So, David, you've made your own iPhone app. I don't even understand I... how you've done it, but it just seems amazing. Yeah, that is amazing. That is, I mean, that's, if, I, if that's hack of the week, I mean, I, I'm, yeah, that's, that's an amazing hack. hack of the year. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, yeah, so that's a definite hack. Uh, and if you want to see the Wahoo one that's just been launched, the Wahoo Headwind, which is kind of like a super polished version of that, and that you and I can actually go out and bike, then that is on a uh, GCN video that went up on Sunday night. Yeah. 
Anyway, there we go. That is it for Hack or Bodge this week. Uh, remember, if you want to submit anything to us, then it's very simple. Just via the GCN Hack hashtag on Twitter and Instagram or send us something on Facebook. There we go. Fair play, David. What a hack. Well, it's time for Caption Competition now. Your chance to win a GCN Camelback bottle and a brand new one too, not even a dirty one. I found a dirty one in here the other day. <laughs> I'm not sure who that it wasn't was. Me. I swear it was not me. Uh, yes, last week's caption photo was this one from the Italian National Championships, and we have a winner. That winner being Brandon Tucker, who put caption comment Viviani National Crampion. Uh, well done to you, Brandon. Get in contact with us on Facebook with your address, and we'll get this sent out to you ASAP. Uh, this week's photo is from the Tour de France, and it's Chris Froome recovering from his stage one crash. Emma is going to get us started. Uh, yes, well, it looks a little bit like he's doing some cyclocross there, I reckon. But anyway, let's have a go with, uh, how about, uh, you ready for this? <clears throat> There's not enough room on the road. That is not bad. That is not bad. Annoyingly. Uh, if you can do better though, leave your comp captions in the comment section down below and we will award another bottle this time next week. Before we get on to telling you what's coming up on the channel over the next seven days, as ever, we're going to go through a few of our favourite comments underneath the videos from the previous seven days. Indeed, starting out with Niels Heldens, who uh, was commenting on uh, Cy and Ollie at Eurobike. Um, there was a moment where Cy got a little bit excited, and uh, as Niels pointed out, uh, Cy momentarily turning into Gollum. <laughs> that was embarrassing, mm. wasn't it? Both for Cy and for all of us, yeah, quite frankly. Yeah, I agree. I think maybe we, we should edit that out next yeah. time. Uh, next up, Dave Pratt wrote in under the Giro Rosa preview show and said, Dan, Emma's time might have run out, but unlike another presenter, she had a time. I take your point, Dave. Very good point at I that. I don't, don't think I'd agree. I never rode a Tour de France, mate. <laughs> well, yeah. Or came top 10 in Strada been. Bianchi. You either. probably wouldn't have been right at the back had you done one. Uh, moving on. Yeah, so last of all, we've got Fergal Akai. Sorry if I've got your name That's wrong. That's brilliant, because everyone's always commented about how good your pronunciation is. <laughs> well, it's Fluff rubbish that, now. didn't you? <laughs> yeah, terrible. <laughs> <laughs> to be honest, the writing's really small. I think I need my reading specs. Right. Uh, what the heck? Tom Lars not even getting the chance to make a prediction this year. Has the brick disappeared? Release the Tom. Free the lasty. Rise up and smite your oppressors, my son. Or at least topple sigh. He's passionate, Ferg, wasn't he? Yeah, and, and I have to say that we will let Tom know, back in the cupboard where he's locked up, that uh, that you support him. He had a lot of support, actually, underneath our Tour de France preview show, wondering where he was with his prediction. That was actually our fault, because we mm. did film his prediction for the 2018 tour, and then forgot to put it in. Actually, it was just rubbish, so we didn't put it in, did we? <laughs> I, don't, I can't even remember what it was. Uh, but here it is for you right now. Vincenzo Nibali will win this year's Tour de France. Right then, coming up on the channel this week, starting with tomorrow, Wednesday, if you're not watching this on a Tuesday, we have got How to Sprint. This is a must watch actually, because for the first time ever on GCN, uh, this How to Sprint episode comes from somebody who can actually sprint, uh, that being Mr. Opie. So forget all our advice before and make sure you listen to that one. And Opie is back again on Thursday, showing you seven ways that you are slowing yourself down. Then on Friday, as ever, we have Ask GCN Anything. Leading into Saturday, which is Get Fit Quick series with again Chris Opie and Sunday retro climbing hacks with you guessed it Chris Opie. Yeah. Although I do have a minor ride in ride out role. It's like Chris Opie week. It is, this yeah, week, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, as ever on Monday we'll have the GCN Racing News Show, with wrap ups from the Tour de France and the Giro Rosa. Uh, Tuesday back in the set for the GCN Show. And of course, make sure you check out our daily content on Facebook with the Tour and Giro Rosa highlights. Yes, make sure you do that. And also stay tuned for extra content right here on our YouTube channel uh, coming from the Tour de France and also from Eurobike. That will be spread across GCN and GCN Tech. Almost the end of the show. And that means Extreme Corner. A bit late with your ex there, Sorry, I Emma. Uh, this week, it comes from the Big White Slope Style Contest. Those kids, they're just ridiculous. Sick, they? sick. Bats, yes. 
Um, that's the end of this week's show. Apologies for being slightly old most of the way through it. Uh, we hope you've enjoyed <laughs> it though. If you have, give us the thumbs up uh, by clicking on the thumbs up button just down below. A uh, quick shout out though, <coughs> sorry, before we finish, to the GCN shop, shop.globalcyclingnetwork.com, where you will be able to find our July themed t shirt, such as that sported by Emma and this one sported by me, plus the yellow on black and a whole host of other sweatshirts and hoodies too. There is indeed also a new GCN fan kit jersey, which you should check out. Out. Yeah, that's on its way very soon, so make sure you keep your eye on the shop for that. Uh, in the meantime, before next week's show, why don't you check out our Eurobike tech extravaganza uh, where Sire does his Gollum routine, which is just down here. <laughs> <laughs>